Hello, I'm Corey Ofsted, and my team designs and conducts real-world studies. Today we're talking about sterile processing issues in outpatient urology departments, which use a complex mix of instruments for procedures involving sterile tissue. Now look, this video is made for people who already know the basics about sterile processing and infection prevention. And I'm hoping to spark your curiosity about what's going on in outpatient urology departments, because I think they've been overlooked in terms of ensuring safety for patients and for the personnel who work with contaminated instruments there. So we're going to start with a story about a superbug outbreak that happened in a hospital in London and was ultimately linked to urology scopes. My colleague John Island and I had the good fortune to visit with the lead investigator for this outbreak. And she told us that the lab had noticed that there were a bunch of infections uh, happening in patients who had a superbug that was a weird one. They didn't see it very often. And so they looked into it more and they determined that all of the patients who were infected had actually had procedures with flexible ureteroscopes used in an outpatient setting. More than a third of them got infected with eight developing sepsis requiring hospitalization and the others having lower urinary tract infections in spite of all those antibiotics they'd taken. The investigators found the superbug in a ureteroscope that had visible damage. And then they noticed that another scope that had been used for some of these patients had a flap of material dangling into the lumen like this picture shown here and also failed a leak test. Once they knew there was a big outbreak, the investigators looked into how the scopes were being reprocessed and they found that there had not been pretreatment at the point of care. There were substantial delays before the scopes were brought to central sterile processing for cleaning and high level disinfection. And there were other breaches. Now the department pulled those scopes out of service and addressed their breaches and that stopped the outbreak. Now it's not about just this one outbreak in London. The FDA receives hundreds of adver adverse events reports every year that are linked to urology scopes. This is a couple examples of patients who got injured when a urology scope that was visibly damaged was used for their procedure. And there are lots of cases of infections that are ultimately linked to contaminated urology scopes. Now, in fact, a couple of years ago, the FDA announced that they'd received more than 450 reports of infections or contamination involving urology scopes like cystoscopes and ureteroscopes. And they said it was due to inadequate processing and maintenance, but also possibly due to issues with device design. And they provided a list of recommendations, like following the IFU for pre-cleaning, leak testing, manual cleaning, etc., before sterilization or HLD, and pulling damaged scopes out of service, which makes sense. They also said that patients should be informed of the risk associated with procedures involving urology scopes. Now, since then, AMI and AORN have released new standards that are more stringent, and they classify urology scopes as high risk scopes because they're especially difficult to process. And, they, and that increases the risk that germs are not completely removed during the processing uh, procedure. So they recommend extra steps be taken to ensure that scopes are clean before we attempt sterilization. But when we've visited outpatient urology clinics in the field, we've observed that the problems go way beyond just cystoscopes and ureteroscopes, because we have seen problems with ultrasound probes used for prostate exams and also stainless steel instruments used for surgery in the clinics. Now the root of the problem seems to be a combination of inadequate space and setup to do sterile processing in these outpatient departments and also personnel who aren't trained in sterile processing. They're just expected to do it in addition to their clinical duties. So let's take a look at some of the examples of what we've seen in outpatient urology clinics. Personnel often skip the pretreatment that's supposed to happen immediately after the procedure. And this cystoscope we found just kind of draped over the top of a cart that also had sterile water and some partially used tubes of lubricant. Now it hadn't been wiped down or flushed and it wasn't being kept 
moist before going to um, be processed. So got a couple breaches there. Now this facility was actually washing their scopes in the hand hygiene sinks in the patient care room. And they were doing this by squirting a syringe full of undiluted enzymatic detergent on the scope and through the channel. And I'm brushing it with a channel brush and got a picture of that. It's hanging right on the wall next to the sink, very convenient. But that brush was never cleaned or disinfected or sterilized between uses. So that's kind of gross. In this clinic, there was no leak testing at all, no visual inspection, and no cleaning verification test as required for urology scopes. But wait, it gets better. They then dunked the cystoscope in a blue basin of glutaraldehyde that was sitting on the counter in the patient procedure room. The scope was still wet because they took it out of the sink and put it right in there, and that dilutes the HLD. Turns out they were not doing MEC tests either, so we have no idea if that HLD was strong enough, but look at that neon green color. It's not usually quite that green, and we wonder if it was extra green because of all that blue detergent that was in the channel since they didn't rinse it out thoroughly. Now, you might notice something else, which is that the universal cord of the cystoscope is just kind of draped over the edge of that glitteraldehyde basin. That's because they didn't realize that you're supposed to disinfect the whole scope. And once they finished dunking it in the HLD, what'd they do? Ah, they dunked it in the other basin that's sitting here, which they said had sterile water in it. Now they put sterile water in there every morning and then they used it all day and never cleaned or disinfected or sterilized the bin it's in, but they really held to their statement that that was sterile water for the rinse. Okay, let's turn our attention to ultrasound probes used for prostate exams and biopsies. And we'll start in this ultrasound procedure room that was allegedly ready for the next patient with a clean chucks and a drape sitting on the exam table. Now here's a closer look at the counter in that procedure room. Do you notice what's in the sink? Well, that's a transrectal ultrasound probe that they left in the hand hygiene sink to drip dry after being processed with the tip of the probe sitting in the sink drain which is so gross. Anyway, I put on gloves and picked it up for a little look-see, and here's what I saw. Can you see the brown stuff in the grooves used for attaching the needle guide to the probe? Here's a closer look. Given the nature of procedures that use transrectal probes, I'm just gonna let you use your imagination about what that brown stuff might be. So anyway, that made us wonder, how was this being processed? And here's what we learned. The processing was done in the hand hygiene sink, and they kept a couple of toothbrushes for cleaning instruments handy on the ledge behind the sink. And the manager said the brushes were never cleaned or sterilized between uses. Now, once they scrubbed the instruments, they gave them a quick rinse in the same sink, and then, you guessed it, they put the wet probe in a basin of glutaraldehyde conveniently located on the counter in the procedure room. And it turned out that the glutaraldehyde was really their chemistry of choice for everything. They also used it on stainless steel instruments and dilators. And then, oh yeah, they dunked them in the basin of sterile water for the final rinse. With that rinse water used all day, just like it was in the other room. Now, this was the same urology clinic as the cystoscope we showed you, so you can see similar practices and breaches throughout. Now, here's a probe we saw in another urology clinic. The distal end of the probe is discolored, possibly from inadequate cleaning or rinsing of the OPA that they were using for HLD. We, al we also noticed a big old needle gouge right here. Now, they hadn't ever heard of visual inspection and nobody thought anything of the discoloration or that needle gouge. And we asked about the needle gouge. They were surprised because they said that they use a needle guide to prevent such gouges and they showed it to us. It was conveniently kept on a piece of foam in this dirty little container 
and they said they dunked it in HLD and rinsed it off in the sink in the patient room. Now, this is supposed to be a sterile needle guide for doing biopsies. So now we're talking about stainless steel instruments, which I had assumed were always sent to central sterile processing for decontamination and steam sterilization by professionals who know what they're doing. But how wrong I was. So let's go back to that urology clinic that was processing scopes and probes in procedure rooms. What about the stainless steel instruments there? When we were doing our walkthrough, we noticed that this room had been used for a procedure but it wasn't yet cleaned up. They had a bunch of used dilators that hadn't been wiped down, and when we looked closely, we could see blood on the tips. Now, the nurse manager said that they cleaned them in this sink. Well, after they got rid of the bloody drape and the beaker of urine that were sitting in the sink, and they scrubbed them with that blue detergent that's sitting there in that urine cup on the sink ledge. Then, they let them soak in basins of glutaraldehyde that were sitting on the counter in the same room. Now, actually, they said they stored the dilators in that glutaraldehyde all the time because they said that kept them sterile and ready for the procedure. So what else is wrong with this picture? Well, the tips of those dilators aren't actually fully submerged in the HLD, so it's not sterile and probably not even disinfected. And there's half a cystoscope in the room on the left hanging out behind the faucets. And in the other room, there's one on the counter kind of draped over there because the staff erroneously believed that they only had to dunk the insertion tube part of the scopes into the glutaraldehyde. And they let the rest just sort of hang out on the counter. Okay, now we're gonna wander down the hall to a procedure room that was used for vasectomies. There we found this beaker stuffed full of stainless steel instruments and a toothbrush in a blue detergent solution that looked a little bit too blue to me. So that sparked questions about how they were diluting their cleaning solution. And the staff didn't know anything about dilution at all or about rinsing. We just were met with a big, huh? So anyway, we walked away, took some notes on this and thought we'd come back later. So we did. And this is what we found. All the instruments were left laying out to dry on the chucks after having been cleaned by the nursing staff. Now, even from a few feet away, we could see something was wrong as the hinge areas were all nasty and there were drops of yellow and brown fluid on the chucks. So we took a sterile swab and rubbed the hinge area of one instrument and yellow gunk came off on the swab, which is nasty. At that point, we hardly dared ask what they did with the instruments after sort of cleaning them in the hand hygiene sink. And we learned that they processed everything, everything that was sterilized in this tiny little countertop autoclave that was physically dirty and rusty. And there is so much wrong with this picture. But we're gonna take a look at one thing. They stored sterile items in peel pouches underneath the autoclave. And you can see that something nasty had dripped on those peel pouches, which is not good and left us wondering what could have dripped there. Oh, and a bunch of the stuff was long expired too, by the way. So anyway, when we were looking at all those peel pouches, we noticed that they had some disposable bovie pins used for cauterizing tissue. And they said they used them during vasectomies and other procedures for male urology patients. Sounds reasonable, but then we found a bunch of items in a drawer in a vasectomy procedure room. So the blue thing with a cord is a disposable Bovie pencil that is used for cauterizing uh, tissue, as I mentioned earlier. And underneath it was a cautery needle that had been improperly wrapped and sealed for sterilization. And underneath that, there's a handpiece sheath at the bottom. So the first question we asked was, why do you have disposable instruments out of the peel pouch in the drawer? They're supposed to be chucked after use, right? Oh, they said, that's where the sheath comes in. They were reusing the single-use handpieces 
without cleaning or sterilizing them between uses. Of course, there's no IFU for cleaning or sterilizing them because they're a single use device. And given the fact that it's not sterile, they thought that what they could do is just use a sterile sheath on the handpiece, right? And so we said, okay, right, but how does that work with a needle or the other tip in the bovie to do the cauterizing? And they said, oh, it's easy. You just put the sheath on the handpiece and then you poke the needle through the bottom of the sheath, just like this. So anyway, I've never been a big fan of using condoms that have holes in them. And this seems like a really bad idea for so many reasons. So you've had a quick look at some of the things we've seen in outpatient urology clinics. And so now what? You know, in my view, the only way out of this mess is for urology departments to actively engage with experts in sterile processing and infection control to improve their practices and reduce the risk for patients and for the workers in those units. So here are some ideas for ways to reduce risks in outpatient urology departments. First, bring stakeholders together and do a baseline assessment, like an informal audit. Then determine the priorities for improving the setup and practices and consider um, centralizing the processing for all instruments used in urology departments, sending them to a professional sterile processing area where they're trained and equipped to handle that. Now, for usable scopes and other instruments, we should definitely be moving towards sterilization rather than HLD, and we've got to repair the damaged instruments before they can hurt any patients or fail processing. And lastly, we should provide the personnel with adequate training and competency for every single instrument they're expected to process. Now, we need to ensure that processing is done correctly for every instrument every time. And that means pretreatment at the point of care, rapid transport to sterile processing, thorough cleaning before attempting to do sterilization, and drying as needed in the workflow, etc. But we got to make sure we're doing all of those quality assurance uh, checks, the leak testing, visual inspection, cleaning verification tests, um, CIs or BIs or MEC testing for every instrument, every time. And lastly, you should consider the role of sterile single use items for scopes and for other instruments like that Bovi, because if they're really not set up to do sterile processing, then we gotta make it easier to do things safely and right for everybody. I think the bottom line is we gotta get going by engaging with our urology departments and doing something to improve practices and reduce risk for patients and the workers in those areas. So for more resources, we have several other YouTube videos and CE courses and a couple of published articles that you might find helpful. Thank you for watching this webinar. Here's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to us or watch our other videos and YouTubes at the links below. This webinar was supported by an educational grant from Healthmark. Healthmark provided our team with financial support related to the development of this video. Please contact Healthmark directly for information about their products and educational services at www.hmark.com. Here's a list of disclaimers you should read before making any changes to policies or practices at your facility.